All right, I want to welcome everyone, everyone to uh, another interesting episode of the Sideshow with Frankly So and Tenoro. Although tonight we're kind of sans Tenoro. But we do have a couple of guests with us tonight, and tonight's topic is robots. More specifically and more particularly, self-reconfigurable modular robotics. Uh, our guest tonight is Neil Desmond and Per Zoberg. And hey, let me introduce my first guest tonight, Neil Desmond of Desmond uh, Innovations. Hello. So how are you doing tonight, Neil? I'm feeling a little sick. Been feeling sick for the past week, but I'm feeling a little better now. I, I've had similar, yeah, uh, kind of a flu or cold kind of thing going on. Um, so we're going to be talking about something that you've been working on for a good little while now, a couple of years as I understand it, right? Well, actually, uh, I've been working on it since... Uh, June or July of 2001. Oh, my goodness. More than just a couple <laughs> years. Yeah, a little more. Okay. And so uh, are there any kind of new uh, developments in the field that, you know, that we might not be familiar with from YouTube? Um, I haven't been... Uh, uh, seen much lately. Um, what's probably happening is a lot of background research and um, exploring. Um, I haven't uh, talked to too many people lately. I've been to uh, at least one conference where I met a lot of people back in the summer of 2006 um, and uh, uh, learned about a few things they're doing. Uh, but beyond that, um, I, I don't know too much. Um, maybe Per might uh, know much more about that. Okay. So, Per, uh, did I pronounce your name incorrectly, Joberg? No, perfectly, perfectly. As good as okay. an English-speaking person <laughs> could do it. I think that okay. I probably need a I probably need, need a stage name, and the area certainly needs a better name than self-reconfiguring modular robotics because that certainly is a name for yeah, for it a, is a mouthful. mouthful. Yes. Uh, so what I'm thinking, as what Neil said, is that I went to um, the couple of major uh, uh, scientific conferences that that are focusing on robotics, and that's uh, ICRA and IROS. Uh, I went to uh, let's see. Uh, I went to uh, ICRA 2010 and I attended uh, the workshop where, where basically all researchers in this field um, they gather there roughly every year. And I also attended the same workshop in in San Francisco now, just in I think it was in September. Um, when it comes to progress, what I'm seeing is that uh, we've got some overview of the area. We know what kind of problems we have. We know what kind of problems that's going to be hard to solve or where we need uh, workarounds and work on those workarounds is going reasonably okay. Uh, we also know, uh, yeah, we kind of know what are, what the problems are that we're facing. Um, and, we, and the research is going on at several institutions and what I'm saying here is that we didn't start the computer revolution by what we have in front of us. I mean, laptops with huge computing power and whatever. Um, we started it with something much simpler and right. then evolved from there. Um, we're seeing a lot of work, for instance, in automated building. Uh, they're, they're talking about building regular houses, but they're also talking about building, for instance, levees uh, and, and, and doing stuff like that. And there, in, in that subfield, we're, we're seeing some great progress. Um, we're also seeing progress on verifying work that was done maybe uh, like three or four or five years ago on, on algorithms that saying that it is possible to control all these robots in an efficient manner. Um, that work is coming out of, uh, of um, 
Michael Rubenstein's work, he's, he started doing the algorithmic work and then went on to challenge himself to build a thousand robots, uh, actually 1,024 robots for a kilobyte of robots. Mm. Hence the product name is Kilobot. Um, and, and we see that, that his algorithms are actually able to control efficiently these robots um, in the same way as he predicted. And that means that his algorithm that would be able to control even 3D robots, his robot is 2D right now, they are, uh, we estimate that they will work. And that's okay. a huge, huge thing we didn't know like five years ago. Okay, so now forgive me if I sound like a novice because, well, I am. And besides, a lot of our audience members are absolute novices, don't know even as much as I do about it. So I'm going to ask you some questions that might sound stupid to someone who's been in the field for a little while. There are no Such stupid as, questions. Right, yeah, exactly. Um, only questions stupidly not asked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And going to these conferences and seeing these professors and these hugely bright students present, I just realized that is a very humbling experience to go there and see the average level of intelligence in the room is just crazy. So. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about these algorithms now, are we talking about uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence? A and would these self-reconfigurable modular robotics, understanding the first part of the term self-reconfigurable, meaning obviously they must be self-determined in some kind of way. Are they using AI for these configurations or how far along as, are we with that? As far as I know, they're not using AI. They're using very, very simple rules and then the end result you want it emerges from that kind of like a beehive or um, ant hill works, how uh, if you look at, for instance, the work on termites, so we're learning from termites how they organize themselves to build these huge mounts, uh, and, and we're doing it the same way. What I'm seeing is that self-reconfiguring modular robotics is a material, and it's the ultimate material to build a body so that when we have uh, an AI system up and running, uh, we have a body to put it in because, of course, you need your your body to, to kind of exist in the world. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So if if each of these modules has a brain in and of itself, mm -hmm. um, would that end up being something more to the effect of a cloud computing modular robotic system? I understand where, where it as the, being... Uh, where the, each of the little brain modules ends up to uh, ultimately adds together to the sum of its abilities? Exactly, that's what I understand. And they don't do that consciously. They only do their little thing, follow their little rules, uh, right. as the termite does. I mean, the termite has, uh, has a very small brain. But by doing this in unison, uh, they create uh, something much bigger than, than a single termite, of course, could do. Okay, right. Yeah, so... Um... So they end up working together. Uh, yeah. When one goes up, the other one goes down, and, and you end up with that snaky motion that we've seen in some of the videos on, on YouTube. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. So what does all of this mean to sustainability now? Because, you know, we're – Especially with with my radio show, with, with this radio show and, and our approach on things, we try to approach things towards the sustainability and moving towards sustainability. So uh, in what ways could these robots be used to address sustainability issues? Do you want to start on that, Neil? So Let's see. It's, <laughs> it's kind of hard to figure out where to begin. Um, but I did have a like a thought experiment um, I wanted to kind of illustrate, and it initially starts off without not only not talking about uh, what self reconfigurable modular robotics is, but it um, it's it's an example of just you know your your the common perception based robot. Um, would you? Uh, would you like to hear it, uh, Frank? 
Okay. All right. Um, it's it goes like this. Um, imagine that you could go into a store, and the store is kind of like a Apple store. It sells products or an, any electronic store, um, and you can uh, get uh, a the store shelves just have these boxes, and then these boxes are robots. And just for simplicity's sake, let's just say they're human shaped. And you could uh, basically program this robot, or configure, or um, uh, set it up to basically know everything you know and do everything you do. And let's let's uh, ignore the. Uh, feasibility right now and just pretend like you can just uh, put a like a, a a suction cup on your head and with a wire coming out of it and then you plug the other end into the robot and then you make it uh, uh, so that you have a robot that can do your job uh, uh, it can you know, it knows how to cook what you like it it can drive so it can be your chauffeur now but what does that mean? That means that basically you can have a robot that does your job for you and you don't have to work anymore. And that's just the uh, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Now, imagine you buy another one and you just make a copy of it. So now you've doubled your productivity rate. Um, that example, well, I guess you can kind of just uh, go from there and figure, well, that, that opens up all kinds of doors. Uh, but uh, that's actually an inside-the-box thinking approach to what I believe you'll be able to do with self-reconfigurable modular robotics. I think what you have is analogous to having a robot that not only cannot transform like a transformer, it can't transform it at all. Self-reconfigurable robotics is like the T-1000 on the Terminator in that it's you think you're looking at a fluid when it reshapes itself, but it's not. Let's say the uh, T1000. Um, let's let's forget about it being a uh, uh, the the science fiction killing machine sent from the future to um, to to be the the antagonist, the bad guy. Um, and let's just say you look at it under a microscope, and you don't see this liquid metal or I think what they said was polymimetic alloy and right. instead you yeah instead you see um, levers uh, these metal containers or cells or whatever you want to call them and inside of them you see gears and wiring and electronics and computer memory and all that and these uh, things can connect and disconnect to each other and uh, so basically um, uh, with that, you have something that's so much better than that than that uh, robot that looks like Rosie or Bender, uh, you know, Rosie from the Jetsons or Bender right. from uh, Futurama. Futurama. Yeah, uh, you have something. Uh, well, actually, now I just realized uh, there is an example in the Jetsons. If you recall the beginning, uh, the father George Jetson, uh, he's uh, in his flying car. Mm -hmm. And then he lands at work, and then suddenly the car changes into a suitcase, and yep. it's light enough for him to pick up. So that yep. would be an example. You could think of that as a transformer, I suppose, but you have something that changes size and shape and color and all that. Um, okay. And I'm thinking in real life, why would it have to be as big as a uh, uh, a suitcase? It could be as small as something that can fit into your wallet. Um, so if you have something like this, you can have something that I believe can um, will have the flexibility where all you have to do is program it. You could use it to grow your crops, uh, build your homes, um, uh, uh, do um, what what's that called uh, when you um, well uh, uh, the farming. Um, I forget the word I'm trying to think of, but um, agriculture. Yeah, I was irrigation. That's what I'm trying to think of. That kind of thing. Um, and of course, this wouldn't be the only technology you'd be using. You'd be combining other technologies that are more, um, if you will, economic to implement. Uh, for example, using uh, um, oh, what are those uh, wave? Har 
energy harnessing machines that you can put out in the ocean. Um, mm, uh, put, right. put them out there and pump. The, this is another idea I'm getting into, by the way. And, uh, you know, you have it uh, hooked up to some reverse osmosis um, machines, and then you use the wave energy to produce uh, uh, fresh water. Um, and um, so you're not uh, burning uh, any fuels to do that. You're just using the Earth's natural energy. And, okay. um, yeah, so as far as sustainability, I think uh, I think people should at least consider exploring it, looking into it, pondering it, seeing if, uh, see if maybe they'll have a thought or two. Well, one way that I can see that, uh, that self-reconfigurable modular robotics would, uh, would add to sustainability is would be in the cost reduction that they would necessarily bring to just about everything. I mean, from mass production to even the production of robots, you know, if my you take of it, a robot that is, go ahead, Per. My take on the sustainability is a bit different. I go to the to the the, the very core of modular robotics is that we have these modules and they're very very general. I mean, it's like a Lego piece. If you got a Lego piece, you can build this, you can build that, you can build the other thing. Uh, right. So each piece can be a part of so many different things. Uh, so, for instance, say that you make, you, you take some resources, so this is going to be energy, this is going to be human time, it's going to be uh, materials in metal and, and plastics. You mm -hmm. build one of these modules, uh, and then after you've built the module, you decide it's going to be a part of my house, or, or a part of an office space, or, or, or a part of something. And, and then you decide, well, I don't need as big a house or this office building needs to move to some other location because we don't need them here anymore. Today we have recycling where we are trying to recuperate energy or material from, from what we don't need anymore. Uh, right. Because the units, and they can do this on their own since they're self-reconfiguring, uh, they can move from one use to another. We can, on recycling, add what I've just on my own started to call reassignment. So what we do is we reassign them from one task that we don't need anymore, say it's your old car, uh, to something you need, your new car, or, or, or whatever. So that instead of trying to do the recycling part, which is kind of complicated, we have to gather all the material, we have to rework it. This, of course, takes a lot of time um, and also energy. Um, if you have the modules, um, they could reassign. They can move from one task to another, and one solution to to the new solution that you need. This means that resources will go towards making units, and then, as long as they're usable, we can use them, the, irrespectively of the task we need to solve. Uh, and also, when a module is broken, we have made a huge number of identical modules. So we know them very well, and we can gather all the modules of a certain type, and we could just run the factory in reverse, because we've made trillions and trillions of the same module. It pays to make a factory that runs in reverse. Um, and then we can pick it apart. We can decide that some parts are still usable, perfectly OK. Uh, so we'll just make new units from those. Some units are, some parts of the unit is actually kind of worn and not perfect, but we could rework it so it's still usable. This will require much less material and time and, 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 and energy um, than doing a new part. And of course, when, uh, when we have a part that is totally broken, uh, we know exactly what kind of material is made from so we could recycle that material much better instead of trying to guess what this thing is made out of and and trying to guess what we could use the the, the material it's made out of from uh in a, in something new uh something new so i think that sustainability for me goes to the core of the modularity of the com uh, of this uh, concept how can we present this fantastic research that is being done uh, in so many institutions all over the world, so that you get an, um, get excited about it and start contributing. So that anybody out there listening, 
uh, check out Neil's site, selfreconfigurable.com. Check out my blog, flexibilityenvelope.com. Uh, check out the wiki page on self-reconfiguring modular robotics. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm sure Neil will be happy to answer them, or if uh, I will certainly be happy to help in trying to find an answer. Hopefully, we'll get Frank back soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is this what they call string it when we, in a broadcast where, where you have to speak a little bit longer so that so that there's no silence? Uh, well, dead air is never a good thing, but we're <laughs> in America. We're what we're doing right now is called winging it. Yeah. Okay. So so certainly we're winging it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hopefully hopefully we'll ha we won't have to do it for much longer. Eh? Yeah. Hopefully, but we're you know we are slaves to the technology as well. Yeah, we are, and, and, and this is actually something that I've been thinking of lately when it comes to just modular robotics. I mean, now we have this pretty basic, I mean, not the fact that Frank dropped out of the call is annoying, but it doesn't really have any major consequences. No. With what we've seen in, in Internet today with, with, with very advanced viruses like the Stuxnet or, or, or big attacks on Google where oppressive regimes try to try to block people from, from, from freeing themselves. I think that the security and safety around modular robotics is just essential because if your walls are made out of this material, a malfunction is kind of more serious than, right. than what we're experiencing now. Well, here's a question that was popping into my head as I, as I was listening to you uh, describe mm -hmm. some of these ideas and stuff. Um, and and, and it, uh, when you said the thing about freeing people uh to do other tasks so that their menial jobs or whatever are taken taken over by robotics of some form mm -hmm. um but uh if we were to take that freedom to the next level to mm -hmm. uh because i you kind of mentioned these robots in the context of owning them and, yeah, that, yeah that's would, another thing yeah. i'm not sure we actually will own them because right. that would be reasonably un inconvenient right it would you be would better draw to just, them from would, a pool right it would be better uh, to just have access to them as you need them and when you're yeah. done when you you, you you know while you're sleeping or whatever these robots go back to a distribution center if you will yeah they go right. back into the pool and of course we also need different modules at different times and right. and, and to to make this and and of course at different locations too. If we travel, it would be a very big hassle to bring all your modules with you. So right. absolutely, the, there are quite a number of issues around this. Though, uh, for instance, uh, when you get them from the pool, uh, the pool has to be able to guarantee that you kind of get them because you're expecting to have them. So around that, uh, there's a lot of different issues. What if some if what if somebody tries to stop you from having modules and yeah, well how should we organize because that's also when we get much of the benefits for instance for sustainability and for environmental friendliness is that we should have as few units as possible sure and then return them to the pool draw them from the pool when we need them right and yeah absolutely you're correct in that we shouldn't own them. Uh, we should own as few as possible of them. So there right. might be some very, very special units that very few people need, right. but you need them. Right. And we're all special in some way. Right. Um, and then you have to own those, but basically you want to own as few of these as possible. Okay. That makes sense. Mm hmm And then you, have, you, you also mentioned within the monetary paradigm, like, okay, you know, this would cost this much or this would cost that much. Uh you know, our vision in the Zeitgeist movement at some point is a moneyless society where we have access to whatever it is our needs are. And people stop asking the question, well, how much will it cost to build this? They sh and start asking the question, do we have the resources to build yeah. this? Yeah. What I'm thinking where there is, of course, that since we're making reasonably few types of modules, we don't know yet how many types we'll need, a few hundred, a few thousand different types, which is nothing. If you go into any local hardware store, they've got literally <laughs> tens of thousands of products there. Right. And, and that's just a fraction of what we do. Um, we can do them in very large series, and it, it then pays to optimize production, optimize the units. So my take on this is that the unit will be very cheap. 
Um, and of course, you only pay for it when you're actually using it. Okay. Um, so if you consider how much of your stuff that you're actually using at any given time, that also comes to a fraction of, and of course, you only pay, pay for it when you use it. So right. um, if it's going to be totally free, of course, I mean, somewhere, I mean, you, you use modules, they're made out, they're made by somebody, they're made from something. So totally free? I don't know. Ir I mean, is it going to be a significant price? I mean, if, if it costs you a buck a year, you're not going to care? Uh, no. If we're know. still living in a monetary paradigm. But my concern is, you know, if we have all this technology that mm -hmm. is freeing us up, we should also be free from the shackles of having to work for an income to thereby live on, where... Uh, with all the nanotechnology that's coming out, and I, I, you know, I can dare to guess what we're in for in the next twenty to fifty years with nanotechnology, that that resource scarcity will be almost a thing of the past. I think yeah. so too. Almost is probably the key word here. Right, right. And and how do we handle that remaining, the remaining one percent or something like right, that? Right, right. This is going to have a huge consequence, of course. Uh, and if, if we remove 99% of the cost, I think we're, we're, we're going to, there's going to be so much change in the world that that's going to be more than enough to handle. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, if we get to that point where you're charging a dollar per year to sell modules to everybody, you're probably going to reach that point where you're going to think, you know, I don't really need that dollar uh from people it's just a burdensome overhead it costs me more than a dollar to collect that dollar so i'll just forego the charge you know if you like if you can kind of think of the uh the economic you know uh, if you can uh if you can uh think about it you know uh from the perspective that uh you know the 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 need for money will become obsolete so you're not going to bother with handling it or storing it or right. thinking about it anymore. Right. The need for exchange of, of any kind, barter, uh, even even exactly. the, these ideas today, that th these time banks, which are fabulous ideas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people are exchanging their time. That's what has now become valuable is their time, and they're exchanging it amongst these larger and getting larger groups of people instead of a monetary exchange or some kind of barter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly gonna since since so since the change is so fundamental, it certainly is gonna affect a, a lot of things. Uh, it's also so that not only will we need less money, but it's probably also gonna be easier to create uh, resources uh, because uh, if you are, if you want to add a module to the system. You have this huge pool of modules that already they're already doing what what they're already doing. So you only have to add a small part to it to contribute. Uh, and if you want to do something with the module, maybe you've discovered the best share ever and you've assembled it from modules, and everybody can go and buy your share. It's like an app in the Apple Store. Uh, so, and this wasn't possible for you before because. It was very hard. You had to start a chair factory and you had to transport them all around the world. It was very expensive. Uh, now you can do it as software and you can ship it to everybody instantly and you can charge them a dollar to have a share. Or even like we've seen much in, in the, especially the web 2.0 thing where you use, for instance, advertising or whatever, uh, you get alternate revenue streams. So. I get what I need, somebody else pays for it, and you get what you need to make them. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Because Possibly it's such like a, a small amount of money. It, right. it, it, I mean, for when I do a Google search, it doesn't make sense that I pay per search, right? Right, right. But like Neil said, it would, it, it would seem to me that it would you know, come to that point that if there's so little monetary exchange at all, why bother? <laughs> you know? Like a dollar a year is so it's not I mean in, in this economy anyway, it's nothing. So why bother at all? Why not why not just eliminate that out of the equation altogether? 
I don't know if anybody has studied what happens when something becomes absolutely free. For instance, Google searches are free. I don't know what happens when, when something becomes free. Well, that's the, <laughs> that's the shift in consciousness, the shift in va the value system, if you will, that we're striving for. That people mm -hmm. will wake up eventually through some transitional model and go, wait a minute, what the hell are we doing? You know, why are we, why are we still doing this archaic exchange of, of paper and coin uh, when we have all the resources that we need? Uh, you know, they're being distributed efficiently. Uh, people aren't hoarding them because they can, if they hoard them and create another scarcity paradigm, they can then sell them for a profit. You see, it just it it seems to muddy the waters when you put money in the equation, because then there can be the, then they can build in scarcity to gain profit. Yeah, yeah. This of course does not affect many things that we today value. For instance, like entertainment, we want to go see an artist in a concert. I mean, um, then that artist is in our. In, in, in a sense, an artificial scarcity, and Madonna will only perform for so many people every year. Right, so, right. So there are things that are not affected by modular robotics. What one could say is that they're kind of like less critical. I mean, if you don't have a house to keep you warm and if you don't have food to eat, that's pretty serious. Yeah. If you can't go and see the latest act play, that's yeah. annoying. At yeah, best. Not, not quite as high on the list of priorities as providing basic needs for every human no. being on this planet which as we know i'm sure you're in, you've done enough research to know that we have the technology and believe it or not we do it managed properly we have the resources to take care of everybody probably twice the amount of people that we have on this planet nobody should starve nobody should be without a roof over their heads nobody should be without basic clothing and and comforts of living uh in in this world however we it's fucked up because you know the profit motive gets in and, and muddies the water of all this all these beautiful ideas of of sustainability and sharing and uh not taking more than you need not using more than you need and building things smartly so that they can be recycled and and utilized in other aspects of this robotics uh, paradigm and stuff mm -hmm. And this yeah. is actually a thing I see that when, when we reduce the cost as we do with modular robotics by making huge numbers of a few types and then just paying for them when you're actually using them, we could actually transform quite a number of people from the, the situation where they have today where they can't afford stuff, so they're not a customer, yeah. so they're not respected and treated right. Uh, if, thing, if things become cheap, we could actually create a regular customer uh, supplier relationship for a huge group of people and if somebody makes money off selling these things to them uh, even if it's a little money uh, they're gonna ta be taken care of it we've seen this a lot in the cell phone industry that's just revolutionizing many poor countries by providing cheap cell phone service uh, since the the companies are actually making money on the cell phone services they're always working and the customer can always use them, and they don't go away. Like, I mean, if you get subsidies or if you get aid in some way, sooner or later that aid is going to go away or the attention is going to be turned to another disaster somewhere else. Right. Uh, and, and, and budgets are going to be cut. But if you're a regular customer in a regular transaction, like you and I are used to in our developed part of the world where we buy stuff, we pay them, and we expect to be treated as a customer, right. if we could expand this paradigm to, to, to incorporate a, a huge new group of people, that's going to change their lives just dramatically. I agree. And we could do that with modular robotics since the, the modules are very cheap and you only pay for them when you use them and yeah, so forth. That'd be great. It sounds great. Yeah. It sounds great. But it still keeps us in the money paradigm. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. It does. It's, it's, it's very hard to wrap your head around, you know, getting getting yourself out of this monetary paradigm it, it really does yeah. but you know I, I it from what I've learned and and studied and done investigations on we better start changing the whatever whatever the change is whatever we get to 
uh, whatever we, however we evolve out of this destructive system that we're in, we've got to start doing it quickly because we're literally destroying uh, the very habitat that is sustaining our lives right now. Yeah, we're not exactly uh, um, uh, uh, doing uh, enough. <laughs> I mean, we some people try, um, and uh, it goes, uh, it improves, but then it it kind of like a wave. <laughs> Um, uh, we had some pretty bad pollution um, uh, in the, a few decades ago, and um, now we uh, improve whether it's from regulation or because uh, there's an interest to make things more efficient so that their profit increase. We've uh, done some things, but um, with uh, with this uh, technology, we're going to uh, render so many things that we are we need or use um we're going to render them obsolete right um because uh we have something because we need something else and we need something else because we need something else we need a car to go to work so that we can get a job that pays uh, so we can buy food and pay for fuel and replace our car and pay uh pay mortgage um uh if you have uh if you develop automation enough uh, and uh, the computer technology and the hardware technology so that you have something, a, a, a robotic that's feasible, then uh, you'll actually be able to achieve that servant that has been kind of elusive that uh, you hear uh, that, that, that seems to be the kind of concept that they presented in the movies, whether it was the Wizard of Oz with the Tin Man that would chop your wood for you, or yeah, or <laughs> I, that be I Robot, which would, uh, uh, which um, in that case, uh, yeah, that's actually more of a story of will robots turn on you, uh, kind of uh, personifying technology. Yeah, that's another this is thing. The thing that's I the... think about AI that's very important. That I heard um, Jan Tallinn talk about uh, at Singularity Institute. He said that. Um, creating an in artificial intelligence is a very hard problem. Creating a benevolent artificial intelligence is a very hard and the correct problem. Because if we create a bad artificial intelligence, that's that's a major problem, huh? So where were we before I got cut off? Don't ask me. It, it was uh, Per was talking. We were talking about sustainability, and we've been talking a bit about that again uh, and on, on the recycling issue and the, the, the extending of recycling to reassignment, which is just a super powerful concept. And we also mentioned a bit about how the modular robotics affects uh, actually even recycling. So, yeah, we've been talking about stuff like that. Right, and I was thinking very much the same things. I, pretty much that was what my argument was, was that you know, with modular robotics, where currently when you build a robot, it has a specific task, and that's pretty much the only task it can do. You know, uh, <coughs> robots that build cars that do spot welding of cars, that's all they do is spot welding on cars. And sure, mm -hmm. you can program it to, uh, to program, uh, to weld different types of models, you know, different models of cars, different makes of cars. A and so... It can have any uh, a limited set of numbers, you know, uh, of models that it's going to spot weld in a given day or in a given year. But that's pretty much its only task. All it does is spot welding. It does this all day long, uh, and oh. that's it. Whereas with modular, uh, modular robotics, they could do pretty much any number of tasks. Yeah, uh, that's exactly a, even with the reason. car you mentioned. You mentioned the, the welder welding only a car. The car is only a car, and the house is only a house. This is right. just what we're talking about in modular robotics. It will be whatever you need it to be at the time you need that thing. And if, then right. they'll go back into the pool, and we talked about that, how you ownership of modules a bit too. So when you don't need a particular module, when you don't need a particular number of modules, they'll go back into the pool and... Uh, and just be available for somebody else or, or you when you need them again. So, Yeah. Yep. And, and I'm sure that 
it could work in a commercial world, you know, a monetary system, uh, it just as easily as it could work in a non-monetary based system. Um, yeah. And perhaps even better in a non-monetary based system when, when you're not limited by the affordability, you know, well, I, I, and people will take it different ways whenever you start talking about affordability. Um, when we talk about affordability in this particular instance, what we're talking about is not can we spare the resources for it, but can I afford to pay for those robotics to do what I need them to do, where, as opposed to Joe Blow down the road who has billions of dollars. And also, you, you, uh, when, you, when you say, can I pay for them, you, you can say this in the context of being an average person on the, on the planet. We talked a bit about that too, where we say that you and I are pretty lucky. We have quite a lot of money, but we can't, we can't say that two billion people on the planet live on, on like, what, $10 a, a day or something. And, 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 and there's another billion living on, on, on less than $1 a day. So if right. you're saying, can I afford this? And you are the average person on the planet. That's a whole other ball game again, especially when we compare that to the old technology today. That is just ridiculously, ridiculously expensive for for most people on the planet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, you know, and, and I don't think there's an awful lot of people who realize just exactly how bad it is when you've got a billion people who live on less than a dollar a day. You're mm -hmm. talking about one sixth of the population, let's say you know six people. One of those six people is living on mm -hmm. less than a dollar a day. That's mm -hmm. the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like a half a billion, half a billion of people that that has no part of the monetary system at all. They're yeah. simply living completely without money. Right. That means they can only use resources they find, or 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 resources <coughs> somebody is willing to give them. And that's exactly. just a disaster. Yes. You know, uh, and and that's what happens when you have people living on, how about a handout? You know, you've got, mm -hmm. uh, what what was it, 583,000 or somewhere around there, uh, 583 or 580-some-odd thousand children dying of starvation every day. It's just Not every uh, year, every day. Yeah, it's just a big disgrace, huh? Right, you know, we should be able to solve more this people problem. Dying, you've got more children dying of starvation and preventable diseases every day than you have people dying in wars every year, every ten oh, years. Yeah. yeah, certainly, certainly. And they're 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 also like getting blind because they don't have ten cents worth of vitamin A when they're kids and stuff. It's just <laughs> it's a disgrace for the world. It is, a yeah. and that that any of us Americans. Swedish, Swiss, yeah. Norwegian, uh, African, Jamaican. It doesn't make a shit where the hell you're from. Yeah. If you can look at this world and see those kinds of stark realities and think that you are living to your fullest potential, you've got another thing coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm absolutely with you there. We, we have a responsibility, and uh, especially we in, in the developed world that have huge resources and huge possibilities. We have a a tremendous responsibility of, of, of trying to make the world a better place. And I think that in my own small way, I try to do that with working with modular robotics and, and making it available as easily as possible to as many people as possible. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the things that we're working towards, you know, as a movement, as the Zeitgeist movement, we're working towards sustainability. And, and by sustainability, <laughs> we mean things that are uh, that are recyclable or that can be quickly and easily reassigned to another task that mm -hmm. doesn't end up in a landfill you know if you're reassigning resources valuable resources that you took that somebody took all of their time to dig up out of the ground to refine it and to turn it into a useful product a and the only task you can see to reassign it to is landfill. Pretty terrible, huh? Yeah. Let um, me add, uh, something else on uh, on that issue. Um, uh, the, the technical uh, uh, advantage of um, when it involves recycling it or 
uh, 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 enhancing the design. Uh, what you can do is you can actually study the wear and tear on these things mm -hmm. and uh, see where the weakest uh, link in the chain is and in your future design, uh, version and you can uh, read, uh, um, re let's say it's a quarter that wears out too quickly. You can uh, use stronger material and so that'll make it last much longer. So you're not even ending up with anything that would even potentially end up in the landfill because you have uh, something that's so common and uniform it's um, you've simplified it to where almost the only thing you need to build are these modules everything is modules well not everything but the <laughs> 99 percent again I guess maybe 99 percent uh, or you know something like that yeah so um, <clears throat> are the are the uh, is gear X are are the teeth uh, wearing down too quickly? Uh, use a stronger material to make them, um, or a uh, or a more forgiving material. You know, uh, nylon, for example, isn't necessarily any stronger than uh, than a really good high grade of brass, but it's more forgiving. And we could and also so we could also do what Neil says in. Not in the module, but in the solution. We discover that we've programmed our solution, we've assembled the, the modules in a certain way. That means one of the modules get overloaded. So let's change the, 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 the solution of it so that we use two modules instead of one module there. And then the whole solution kind of optimizes. And, and as Neil says, I think that we could probably do modules that last 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more, especially. In the beginning, we're going to have some issues, of course, but in the long run, I think Neil is perfectly correct in saying that these simply will never end up in landfill. They'll just be used for a long time, reuse the material that made them, and start all over again. So, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I think one of the problems that we run into when it comes to robotics and just about anything else in our world is that, uh, especially within this commercial world, is that uh, the the affordability of it. it it's and the profitability of it you know you end up with a lot of products that are designed intentionally to wear down in a given time frame N not because uh -huh. you want to make it cheaper so it could be more affordable to more people you're des designing that way specifically so that it will break down within a given time frame so that you can sell more of them to those people and others. Yes, right. planned obsolescence. Right. And, and, and we become accustomed to this. Right. I mean, we, we just want the thing looking like new. I mean, just the new design. It, it, it does exactly the same thing. It's just that it looks better or something like that. Yeah. And we, we become indoctrinated into, <laughs> well, I, I've got to have the newest, latest iPhone 4. Oh no, haven't you heard? They came out with iPhone, uh, iPhone 4Z. You got to get that one, you know? And, but yeah, but I got that. Uh, I got the EPad 7, and it's much better than the, you know. Come on, folks. If you did it right, if people really worked together and collaborated, you could design one phone that does it all for everyone. Or in modular robotics, of course, you would have your own Frank phone. It would be perfectly yes. adapted to you because you yeah. would assemble it from the modules that does what you need. Do you want a very small phone or a very large screen or whatever, very large battery? Yeah. Using right. modular well, robotics, and, and you, could exactly. have something, you could have something that is perfectly tailored to you. And so, exactly yeah, there's, what I was thinking about the phone. You know, uh, I'm one of those people, I've got a cheap-ass bone phone. I don't need a smartphone. I don't need all of the uh, fancy little gadgets, and I don't need to be playing uh, Angry Birds whenever I have a free minute between phone calls, you know. Um, I just don't. But not everyone has my limited needs, you know. Some people really want to be able to waste their time getting frustrated all, with some fucking birds. Yeah, words. we're all different. We all have our... That's why... People are saying that, for instance, Microsoft Word and Excel, they have all these features and I've never used them. No, they weren't intended for you. They were intended for somebody else. And we're all unique in that way that we all use 
one of those small features we count the number of words in a sentence or we, we do something and to satisfy that all products satisfy all people's need then we get these very very complicated and and quite frankly not very good products instead of having a something that is tailored to you and beyond that it's even tailored to your needs right now so you right sometimes when you go out in the city you don't need a big phone you just want something to call your friends with in another instance you might need a bigger phone because you want a bigger screen because you're going to read a book or a website uh, so we only we, we, we're not only adapting it to you we're adapting it to you right now and that's a thing that I think fine modular robotics is just crazy exciting yeah and, and that's uh, that's one of the things that I, I whenever I look at the difference between Macintosh and PC okay mm -hmm. Macintosh very well designed very well integrated all of the parts work together and, and they are designed to work together specifically Mm -hmm. Whereas with PC, they're not necessarily designed to work together. You've got compatibility issues, you've got driver issues, and all of these other things that you've got to work out. But with PC, you can have a system that is set up specifically for your needs. You, if you need a webcam, you can add a webcam. You need a better webcam, add a different webcam. You know, upgrade to a better webcam, uh, better speakers or cheaper speakers speakers modems or not uh, uh, routers or not you know uh, wireless keyboard and or mouse or not uh, wireless tablet or not all these more than one things. button on the mouse if you want it you can have it right. if you don't want it you don't have it so exactly. that's the difference between uh, what they're trying to solve because as you say making this open um, the, the the bazaar rather than the cathedral is very hard technically I mean, plug and play was for a very long time plug and pray. So, but it, yeah. the other solution isn't very good either because it's saying it's this way or no way. And that means since everybody's unique, you have this special need. For instance, you might want a very good webcam, uh, but it isn't included in the product because it'd be ridiculous for everybody to have a, a $2,000 webcam or whatever. Um, and then you can't add that. So I think that we have to be open and this also is of course if we're coming back to this that what everybody should do in their lives and how everybody should contribute I mean if, if the system isn't open to begin with I can't contribute I might want to contribute and, and make the world a better place but if I'm not allowed to how could I uh, I mean if you if you want to make PC hardware I guess it's just go out there and do it I mean if you make a better hard drive than Samsung people are gonna buy it yeah well, and that's one of the reasons why in the zeitgeist movement, you know, we talk uh, more about the train of thought rather than the specific map, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was one of the reasons that we ended up splitting up with the Venus Project was because mm -hmm. they had a specific map that they wanted to go by. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, many of us felt like it should be a little bit more open architecture mm -hmm. because – you can't you can't necessarily have a one size fits all. I mean, Macintosh, yeah, okay, great design, but it's not a one size fits all system. No. And in the end, they also get they get. I mean, they're trying to solve a big big hard problem, and their solution, the problem is so that they're in the end they're going to come back to themselves. I mean, I can run a, a, a software that is 25, 30 years old on a PC, and I can run old hardware if it's specially designed. And that's the backwards compatibility issue, because if you have this, everything should work together. S somewhere along the line, you have to say, OK, we can't support stuff that is older than, than this date, and the rest simply doesn't work. And right. uh, so in the end, this is also, you can say, the difference between dictatorship and democracy. Dictatorship can work really well for a few months and for a few years, but in the end, the only thing that can prosper is democracy. It looks bad in the beginning, but after 30 years, it looks just beautiful because the other guy isn't standing up at that time. So, and we saw that very clearly in the East Block, West Block thing, for instance, that in the beginning they were making reasonable progress, but after a few years it just broke down. And so I think that an open architecture where everybody is allowed to do what they're best at and to contribute is 
that's the way forward I see for modular robotics. Yeah. You know, um, we here in America are... Um, we're, we're really good at playing two games. Uh, on the one game, uh, on the one hand, we like to pretend we're ostriches. We stick our heads in the, hand, uh, in the sand, we poke our fingers in our ears, we close our eyes, we wave our asses in the air and pretend like nothing's going wrong. And on the other hand, uh, we're also very uh, exceptional. You know, uh, American exceptionalism, we're number one, we're number one, we're better than anyone else, you know, we're the greatest and richest country in the world, fuck you if you don't like us. So we don't spend a lot of time, because of all of this indoctrination into that particular mentality, we don't spend a lot of time looking at what the European bloc and, and Asian bloc go through with their politics and all of the different types of parties that they have available to them. We just sit here on our little asses pretending like uh, Dem uh, Democrats and Republicans, are, that's the only way to go. That's the only kind of system you can have because if you look at all the others, they all break down to the same damn thing. Either that or all, you, all else you've got is communists and socialists in there. We don't want that because that's stupid. Yeah, it was pretty stupid, I might add. I mean, <laughs> it, it failed pretty, pretty spectacularly. Uh, what I'm thinking is that uh, America has a lot to be proud over. I mean, they've certainly done fantastic things, uh, especially for being such a young nation. I mean, it's amazing what you've been able to achieve, and and especially from where you started. I mean, it's just amazing. So, uh, coming from a very small country, I think that I see this a bit differently uh, because when you when you're thinking business, when you're thinking anything in Sweden, the second thought is what happens outside of Sweden. Because Sweden is such a small country, it's pointless to start thinking about the Swedish market. It's just very small. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's harder to start here because the native market is so small. But it's also so that we, we, many Swedish companies are very, very early in their development. They're out there in different countries, in different markets. They're learning, they're listening, they're adapting. Uh, I think that the Swedish telecom company Ericsson, they were only four years old. Uh, when they were already in, in Singapore running telephone systems there, and this was like a hundred years ago. So Singapore was very far off if you're still in the, uh, what I guess you'd call the 19th century. So, But if you have the American home market, you're not going to do that. So, Yeah, I, I suppose you're right. Uh, I mean, uh, I, as a uh, business owner, uh, mm -hmm. being a, car a carpenter, I don't try to sell my my skills outside of my area I, I there would be little point you know mm -hmm. there are so many other businesses or so many other people who can do something close to what I do in mm -hmm. those other market areas uh, in Texas and Arkansas and Mississippi mm -hmm. and um, so I tend to stick to my little world of Louisiana here mm -hmm. um, and, and more specifically you know, very local community, you know the the yeah. next. Many things city. are like that. They're 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 local, huh? Yeah, uh, a lot of businesses, you know, are agricultural businesses are very similar to that. Although, mm -hmm. when you get into the commercial farming industry, then you can start shipping your goods elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So you might have one distributor that you go through locally, and then mm -hmm. that distributor distributes your goods throughout the world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, back on robotics. Let's not get off topic too far. Uh, we'll, you know, all these people that tuned in to hear about. Well, I want to hear about what kind of cool shit's going on with robots. I want a robot that can uh, that can drill holes in the earth for me and and basically build my geothermal system for me. How far along is that? Can we do that? So, yeah, what I do you think? think? I think Neil can talk a bit, a bit, a bit more about the, the practical engineering, but from what I've heard from the researchers when I've, been, when I've attended these conferences, practical application is still quite a ways off. Uh, we're probably not talking like 25 or 50 years, but we're definitely, we're definitely talking 5 to 15 years. 
but it's also so that when we get started, I mean, the impact on, on a certain field, whatever happens to be the first thing we, we try and succeed on, is going to be huge. And, and from then on, who knows? What do you think, Neil? When will we see these self-reconfiguring modular robotics commercially available? Well, if I had to throw a dart in the dark, mm -hmm. I would guess 15 years. Um, that's uh, that would be the uh, the guess if you were to say well well if it's closer then it would be 15 years if it's longer than now I don't think it would be too much longer than that maybe 25 30 years um, uh, yeah um, when when you look at the uh, uh, development of the computer for example. Uh, what did it? Uh, what did we have before the computer? We had that the computer kind of took over and has now been rendered obsolete. Uh, mm, calculator, lots of things. yeah, typewriters, yeah. printers, Typewriter. printers. Printers. index cards, um, paper catalogs, yeah, drafting boards, uh, mm. any number of things. As a matter of fact, you can now use well. Here we are. We've got a mini produ uh, studio production center going on, and not only that, but it's dispersed. It's a dispersed, networked mm -hmm. uh, recording studio all in one. You know, uh, we've got a camera over there in Sweden uh, recording per. We've got uh, a camera over there in uh, what was it, Virginia? West Virginia? Nor Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia recording Neil. We've got a re camera over here in Louisiana recording me. And all of this is being broadcast through ZBNLive.com, which is actually uh, headquartered in California. This so, is just amazing, isn't it? it, it when you're yeah. thinking about it, when you enumerate it like that, it just feels crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah and, and so, all of this through the magic of computers. Yeah, so we'll 30 years ago, you had to type in 10,000 lines of code just to get it to say hi. Or yeah. a beep, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically, we went from an era where we were using all these single purpose or single application hardware dev uh, well, devices uh, mm -hmm. to something that can handle information. Um, everything is now uh, your, your, your word processor is. Uh, not a machine and a hard piece of hardware. It's it's an application you install on your computer. Yeah. So we have with the computer we have something that's revolutionized the uh, the storage of information, the processing of information, and communication. But the computer kind of is limited in what it can produce in the real world. The the printer, for example, um, it can actually print out pictures and documents and whatever. So that would be an example of where something done with a computer, or actually with 3D, um, I have my, uh, I don't know if you can see my modules. So uh, these were designed, these are my prototypes, not, no electronics, um, no batteries or anything. It's just a geometric shape prototype that, I'm, okay. um, that I uh, designed. And I did this using a cat artist who lives in... Um, um, Arkansas. Okay. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, James. Oklahoma. <laughs> okay. Um, and I never met the guy in person. I just did everything over the computer. And um, he sent me the files. And I paid him by sending them a check in the mail. I could have probably done something electronic, but I just cut him checks um, uh, with my checkbook. And then when I got the files... I sent them over to, um, I could have sent them to any rapid prototyping facility and had them mailed to me, but because I wanted to visit the facility, I, um, I looked for one that was nearby, so about 45 minute, an hour drive or so south of where I live, I, uh, sent, I, I sent the files online, and then when they were ready, I stopped over and I picked them up, and... That's how I got them. So this is the closest we have to uh, having information that produces real-world things. Okay, now, the now ra rapid prototyping, you're talking about the RepRap, the uh, 3D printing 3D uh, printer? Yeah, uh, 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 in, uh, a commercial or industrial strength 3D printer was used for those prototypes. Okay. Um, 
they uh, do prototyping for uh, uh, the commercial industry, for the government, military, whatever. Um, Everybody does it. Whenever you do something, you do one of these prototypes first to see that everything works out. Huh? Yeah, that's yeah, that's where we are now, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now, uh, here, here, enter uh, self-reconfigurable modular robotics. This will fill the ability to do hardware in the way computers do, deal with software. In, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, now you're no longer have fixed to having a car or house or whatever you you, you can program it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but what we say about the computer is it's considered a uh, it's it's actually not a calculator because a calculator is a uh, is a machine that calculates a specific thing a specific thing. The computer is considered to be a universal calculating machine, uh, and that means you can program it to, to be any conceivable calculating machine because we had calculating machines before we had computers. Um, what we're saying about modular robotic is that it's a universal physical machine. It can be assembled and programmed to be any conceivable physical machine. If that's a, the Empire State Building or, 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 or the Hoover Dam or, or your electrical razor, it doesn't matter because it can assume the shape of any physical structure or machine and, and, and that's why it's called a universal physical machine as the computer is a universal calculating machine. Um, you know that the computer, to be a computer was a title before we had electronic computers, it was a work title. Okay, uh, yeah. basically a mathematician. No, actually not a mathematician because they found, they were programmers and the calculator was a kind of a uh, a person that could follow the algorithms. So I know that one of the one of the early founders, I think it was Macaulay. I can check that out. Um, he was very proud to say that he married a, ca a computer. <laughs> so his wife's okay. job was to be a computer. She computed. They did like um, many, they did like weather prognosis, and they did like even um, ballistic trajectories for the army. So all all through the the First World War, they were made by hand usually by women, um, that they were computers. Um, so, Okay. So a, a carpenter is today basically the same thing. You're doing what robots will do in the future. Yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to the day. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong, I enjoy what I do. And mm -hmm. um, if I wasn't doing what I do, I'd probably do something else uh, along those similar lines I you know I'd probably try to figure out a way to get robots to do the job better or to mm -hmm. to be able to create different designs that the robots can then build yeah the, the, the computer can't find out uh, how to make the optimum share it doesn't know what a share is it just assembles itself according to your instructions so a human still would have to design it and, and evolve the behaviors and, 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 and stuff of the solutions. Um, but I don't think we should hide from the fact that, that modular robotics, when it comes, uh, will be a huge creative destruction, just like many other technology things have been in the past. I mean, when we introduced the car, uh, when Henry Ford introduced the car, it just destroyed the markets for, for horse and buggy producers. Except yeah. Cadillac, who could actually transes transcend and, from, from, and from one thing. Yeah. So, yep. But what we have to do is we have to be open. We have to say that this is the new thing. Here you can learn about the new thing, and you could be a part of this revolution. Because we can't stop it. We need it for sustainability. We need it for many, many dozens of reasons. So make it open. Make it accessible to people. Allow them to be a part of it. Now, yep. To get back to the question um, was uh, mm -hmm. what uh, what I thought how how long before we get there. Uh, so my point was that um, with computers we probably I don't know what people thought you know uh, people I don't think they even thought that we'd be getting computers in every home and then uh, I mean they knew that there was mainframes and um, people knew that it took a tremendous amount of energy that were made out of vacuum tubes. People did, it didn't even occur to them, and um, once uh, once people discovered, hey, you can shop online, 
you know, then uh, they put a computer that you can chat with your friends, you can play video games. Now, you know, you know, like a, like a, uh, trying to think of a metaphor, forget it, <laughs> like some kind of explosion, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody's got computers, and now you got a computer that you carry um, in your back pocket that's more powerful than Amazing. that vacuum cube. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so the, it's a matter of when will people realize that this can do everything, then suddenly maybe every but maybe companies will start producing them like crazy researching like crazy and get them out there and um um in the meantime um this is all i have because i can't well, afford to um, to put it into perspective for a few people um think about this um you and the audience um when I first got involved with computers, it was 79, uh, 78, 79, 80, somewhere right around there. They had just come out with this great invention. They called it a PC. What does PC mean? It means personal computer. Oh, really? Is that what PC means? Oh, uh, uh, so what are you supposed to do with this personal computer? Well, you take it home. You can have a computer at home. You know, they, IBM has computers big building full of computers just to do what this little computer will be able to do on your on the top of your desk on your desktop oh wait so we call it a desktop portable computer or desktop personal com a desktop <laughs> pc oh wow modular robotics. Yeah, so now you know where the name came from now let me give you just one more little iota of, of an inkling of what's going on back then it was a super big they didn't even have a hard drive it, what they had what they had was a chip and that chip held what was it like 4 kilobytes now think about that folks if you had only 4 kilobytes in your computer today it wouldn't be able to do shit <laughs> not a damn thing i and think you'd they got be pissed off. they got more than 4 kilobytes of uh, of bios don't they uh, a lot more they, music, they literally uh, couldn't song. start up. Your favorite song is more than four kilobytes. Yeah, yeah, the first, the first two verses of your favorite. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing what we're doing. Now. Some of my friends are saying this, that my, my computer's a bit slow. I bought this laptop a few years ago, and it's not working, Rice. What are you doing? I, um, I'm, I'm looking at this HD movie, and the, at the same time, I'm chatting with my friend because the movie is so great, and we're doing video chat. Do you know how much information that poor computer is processing right now? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's doing a second what it, what, what it took like 10 years for the Apollo project to generate. So, I mean, we're putting huge stresses on our system, and we're just not saying that we're not giving them the, the credit. I mean, you can go out, and, and I guess if you got a PC in 1978, 79, or whatever, it was very expensive, right? Oh, yeah. It was like uh, three or four like, thousand dollars for that computer in yeah, 1978, the, 79 dollars terms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how much was a, I mean, a regular salary at that point was probably uh, uh, a monthly salary. A year, the uh, minimum so, wage uh, at that time was like two fifty. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It's a, so, I mean, and and now you go out Here and in you the can. States. Yeah. So you can go out and buy this computer now for like, if you pay, if you spend a thousand dollars on a laptop. Yeah. You actually get quite a decent laptop. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, uh, hell, I could get a, I could go out and buy a laptop today, five hundred dollars. That's much <laughs> faster, uh, twice yeah, yeah. as fast as my desktop is. Yeah, and, and it's this amazing. desktop it's is only like a year or two old. And this is something I think Neil said very nicely: is that uh, say that you, you, you're you're a producer, you you have some form of a business, you have some form of of what you're doing, and modular robotics comes out it's not in your area yet we're doing something totally totally unrelated but it's actually working and it's just great because it has all the benefits of modular robotics uh, how are you going to look at your business after that i mean sooner or later you know that computers as computers done this they started with with doing the typewriter business and then they did the music business now they're doing the video and and they're just replacing bookstores and i mean if if the 
if there's a new software for um, a, a computer coming out that addresses your business, you just it's just pack up and go home because it's just going to crush it, right? Yeah. What happens when modular robotics comes out? Works a couple of times. They're not very good, but they do work and they have all these benefits. How are you going to look at that and relate that to your business and whatever you're doing? You're not, you, you just sit there and wait for the juggernaut to crush you? Or, I mean, this is also being open, I think is essential. We, we don't want people to throw uh, wooden shoes at our machines. We want them to realize that we've accepted that this is not only good, and we want to them to be a part of, of, of this transformation because it's hugely beneficial for all of us. Doesn't say it's going to be nice all the time, but yeah. Right. Well, you're talking about the uh, what's that movie called? The that where people uh, or that ra I'm sorry, that radio broadcast where people were panicking because they thought oh, they were in, in uh, yeah, War yeah, of the Worlds, the World, the War of the Worlds, yeah. H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds. It was right, yeah. uh, what 1940. Uh, yeah, it's a radio show. It was 43 or something. So well like made. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you put it, let's put it into perspective a little bit. Um, what were people panic? Uh, were people uh, panicking because aliens were showing up, or were they panicking because we were being they thought they were being told we were being attacked? Yeah. yeah. Now, okay. So if you look at okay, um, when automation replaces jobs, and you still need money, you still need to you. you it causes you to lose your job, which you need. Um, to um, earn a living so that you can put a roof over your head and food on your plate, then yeah, mm -hmm. you're going to get upset. But mm -hmm. when the technology is put out there and you realize, hey, this is going to put food on your plate, this is going to put a roof over you, and you don't have to pay a penny, mm -hmm. then we people are going to be, not to destroy it, they're going to be welcoming it. Yeah, yeah. And we also, I mean, this has happened many, many, many times before. And of course, if you worked in a, in a typewriter factory in 1985, or it wasn't a good place. And certainly that's going to be annoying for, 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 for people. But it's also so that the, you get a new job, you do something different, and maybe, hopefully it's better. You know, in the 1970s, when we were talking about robotics, and we were talking about robots... Uh, Essentially, taking over the uh, the industry and and moving into industry and taking jobs, and a lot of people got upset. Oh no, I don't want robots taking my job. And other people said, "Well, you could just move into another field of work. Yeah. It'll free you up to do creative stuff." Yeah. And that and was that, one of the things that we talked about there. Yeah, and of course, that's also what happened. I mean, everybody's going to work today too. It's just not. The robots are working there in parallel with us. It's, I mean, we haven't had massive unemployment, at least not from the, because of the robotics thing. So, I mean, I, I think that this is an issue, and we need to inform people, and we need to be open to allow them to contribute. But if, if that happens, I don't, I don't see this as a huge issue. Well, here's my point, and, and, and it's this. If, if robots end up displacing people mm -hmm. out of work, and there is no other work for them to do, then what we really need to do is re-examine our system and say, hey, is this really the most efficient and most intelligent system that we can operate under? Or should we consider something that doesn't consider money and the monetary gain and profit and, and the motive for profit? Should, mm -hmm. should we maybe consider a moneyless system? And... and and think about that. I mean, when you when you look at the world around you, a lot of shit happens in the name of money and profit, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are in the news front today, you know, all of these uh, activist movements, the uh, the third, the ninety nine percent, and uh, and Occupy, and and all of these other different groups all around the world are getting a lot of media attention based on their argument that. Uh, that we're being ignored. The 99% of us are being ignored by the 1% making all the money, and, uh, and and we're being displaced. We have no jobs, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and and they want to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
I don't remember where the hell I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> Neil's familiar with the show. He he. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, and and we do need to start working on wrapping up the show. So uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and introduce everyone again. Neil Desmond, otherwise known as Basic One, is probably my most loyal listener. Uh, he has been a fan of the show ever since, and he's here tonight to talk to us about what he does, which is robotics. Per Schoberg um, has a blog where he talks about self-reconfigurable modular robotics, and he interviews a few people, a few of the people who are actually working in the industry, working towards creating the technology that advances this field. Yes. So, uh, so these people are not without their merits and not without their credibility. And that's why I just had to have them on tonight to talk about this. Uh, and thank you very much for showing up, gentlemen. Let me uh, share those links with you. You can check out some of uh, some of Neil's other work and some of the videos and and uh, articles and things that he's put together at www.selfreconfigurable.com. You can also check out. Um, some of Per's blog, by uh, his video blogs, by going to uh, itc.conversationsnetwork.org forward slash series forward slash flexible dot html. So be sure to check them out. They've got a lot of information available for you. Per and Neil, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And this is such a big topic that I'm sure. There will be plenty of opportunities for us to do this again. Would you agree? Yes, and thank you for having us and giving us the opportunity to uh, discuss uh, this topic. Yeah, thank you very much. And people can also check out my blog at flexibilityenvelope.com. Okay.